Should piss the neighbors off. Almost nine o'clock at night. Well, so be it. I think we're good to go. Oh, ten seconds. I swallow a bug. So tune on the bug. Jesus. Fortunately it wasn't a very big bug, because I just ate supper. Didn't need those extra calories. So it's May what, May 17th today? Finally starting to get some Consistently decent weather. We haven't had that for a while. It's been on again, off again, on again, off again. Kind of unpredictable. Well, as usual, I don't usually, uh, well, usually I don't go out with a ride, but uh, a topic in mind if I'm going to do the talking thing. I just kind of amble and ramble. I'm not really into the vlogging thing, but, you know, I'll try it once in a while, see if I get comfortable with it. I've done a handful so far. I think most people that watch any of my videos are more uh, apt to watch it just for the sounds of the bike or places I might go to on the bike. Whoa, go train. And not so much the sound of my voice. It drives me nuts, I can imagine what it does for other people. So as you can surmise from just looking at my home page, I have a small channel, and that's fine by me. I have no plans to have a big full-blown channel, that's not why I ride. Now, I started the channel just to sing the praises of the Harley Davidson FXR series bikes, because hey, that's what I want. Maybe I'll cut across Shands Road and head to the airport. Let's do a quick tour of the airport. So Shands Road, which I'm on right now, cuts across from uh, Highway 7 to Kosuth Road. But also it goes behind the uh, Waterloo Region Airport. Jet is probably the biggest barrier we have coming and go from our airport right now. And they usually fly in around 7 o'clock and fly out around 7.45. And I was at the grocery store around 7 o'clock and I heard it coming in because it flies right by where we live. And it comes down low because we're on a hill that's across the river from the airport. And that's their approach run. 
Then I heard it come down, all of a sudden I heard it boost up, uh, like throttle up, and it launched back up into the air, and the last I saw it, it was heading towards what looked like Hamilton Airport. So, I'm not sure why they scrubbed their landing approach. Sure it took off out of here quick enough. Well, I know they could have circled around and come back, but it looked like they were heading towards Hamilton. Airport, main runway. Not 100%, but I think it's about a two mile long runway, so it can handle mid sized jets, no problem. That's by sod farms here. That's where they're all grassy looking. And soybeans. Soybeans and sod. As I was saying earlier about the FXR series bikes, you know, they've got a cult following. I think everybody knows this and knows Harleys. Uh, are they as good as they say? Well, it's an evolution motor, so whatever your take is on the evolution motor, you can hop it up and get a pretty darn good motor out of it. Uh, it's pretty bulletproof cool as far as maintenance goes, uh, even compared to, like, say, the twin cam motors. Uh, the frame is the highlight of this bike. Everyone says Eric Buell designed it. He did not design it, but he made it work. The frame uh, process was already undergoing when he came on board Harley Davidson. And apparently, in his words, in Eric Buell's words, it was abysmal. It was by far the worst frame they had, so they told him to fix it. And to fix it, they did. Living his team. Did an absolutely wonderful job on the frame. It's an absolute delight to ride, not just for Harley, for any uh, motorcycle brand. It is an absolutely wonderful handling frame. As long as you don't mess around with the steering geometry too much, the handling is sublime. Um, me, I did alter my uh, geometry just a tiny bit because the FXRS Sport has the two inch over uh, forks compared to the regular FXRS and it has a half inch longer rear shock. And what I did was I lowered the front a little bit and I raised the back a little bit. And so the, the steering neck angle went from 31 degrees just because of the longer forks to I have it at about, I think, the 29 degrees right now, which is what a stock FXRS would be, but I have longer travel suspension. Now the plus to this model, the sport model, is it has a dual disc front brakes. And as long as you keep the uh, fluid in the reservoir fresh, they're two finger pull brakes, no problem. They may not have the best feel, but, uh, feedback in the world, but they're very strong. I've never had an issue stopping the bike. Even in a panic situation, I've never had an issue. So this is Waterloo Regional Airport. And it's actually become quite a busy airport. It used to be just a little a little squirt airport, <laughs> and mostly hobby flyers coming and going. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, they really expanded business, brought in some major carriers. flight school in there. They do local flights too with the Cessna as if you want to do a little tour. It used to be affordable. It used to be able to take up three people for 180 bucks. Go for a fly around the area. But my understanding is the price has gone up considerably since I last went out. 
one of their tours. It was fun though. nerve-wracking at first if you're just used to being on big commercial jets, being in a little Cessna, feeling every last bump of turbulence, every last dense pocket of air you fly into. But once you get used to it, well, I highly recommend it. to the bike, I keep wandering away from my conversation about the bike. So like I said, the frame's the highlight, the engine can be whatever you want it to be, and then reason. Mine's a 1989. Uh, as far as swapping up the engine goes, I've got it as a, a Bolton Stage 3, which means I've got an aftermarket camshaft, but it's got the same lift as the stock camshaft for an 89. And, uh, and then there was no head work necessary to accommodate a high lift dam. Uh, I'm still running the stock pistons. Uh, I've got the Screaming Eagle heads on here, which is basically it's a larger intake and exhaust valve and higher compression. So I've also got a Dynatech ignition module which uh, lets you adjust the ignition advance curves uh, so I guess all told I've got the Screaming Eagle CV carburetor with the dry tech air filter so you don't oil it and I've never put it on a dyno but my understanding is that the changes I've made, if it was set up tuned properly, as far as jetting and the carb and all that, and a, a, a really well set up ignition advance curve, I should be looking at about 82 horsepower at the rear wheel. And, uh, and uh, about 87 foot pounds of torque. Now, uh, personally, because it's an 89, I wouldn't want to hop it up any more than that. And if you're wondering why, it's uh, the earlier FXRs up until about the early 90s, the cases, the metallurgy for the cases wasn't the best. Probably well, didn't have that game fully figured out yet. So what can happen if you have an older FXR and you hop it up too much is uh, the uh, cylinder studs can actually pull out of the cases. I believe around uh, 92 they kind of got their act together as far as that goes. So if I had a, a newer motor I might consider taking it a bit further. I don't think so though. Just for what I ride this bike for, 82 horsepower or give or take does the job. Without the Screaming Eagle heads on, you're still looking at like 76 horsepower with all the other changes in place. That includes the pipes too, they're done. So, you know, that, that's, I would, if I was to do it all over again, I would save the expense of putting on Screaming Eagle heads. I've had people ask me this, uh, did they make a difference? They make a little bit of a difference. You know, you don't have to twist the, the throttle as far to get the same motion out of the motor. Uh, going up the hill, you're uh, in a situation where you don't have those heads. You'd probably have to downshift with the heads on, the increased torque just keeps you trucking right along, even into lower RPMs. Uh, but just for the cost factor alone, I probably would have just stayed with good camshaft, for whatever your plans are for the bike, if you're two up, make sure you pick a camshaft appropriately. I've got an EV3 in here, which is good for lighter bikes. I don't know how we do if I was doing two up all the time. I haven't had a problem doing two up, but I 
I might have gone with the camshaft that instead of going for horsepower up to the worst of the top, but I have more of a boost in the mid-range. Not that this isn't bad in the mid-range, it's just I know it could have been better in the mid-range. Because uh, I did have the camshaft in place for a couple months before I had the heads put on. And I was quite thrilled with the, the performance boost they gave. Like it was a big jump over stock. Even though the cams are the same lift, the stock. Uh, the, uh, the overlap between the valves and the duration was longer than stock and it, that boosted the mid-range pretty damn good. Ignition module, I haven't here. I've said this in a few other videos, but like I said, not everyone's watching my videos, so I'm going to say it again. I have a Dynatec 2000 ignition module, and it's the one that goes under the uh, right hand side cover behind the, or just below the seat here. It's not in the nose cone. I got it. It's the plastic unit. I had to buy a wiring harness for it. It comes with uh, four uh, preset curve choices and uh, with a, a stock 1340 Evolution motor. The most aggressive curve pre-selector has. Does such a wonderful job of smoothing the motor out as the RPMs climb. You can't believe you ever put up with the, the stock one. I recommend the Dynatec ignition module if you have a, an older FXR. If your bike's starting to misfire on you after it gets hot, it's probably time to replace your ignition module. Because that's why I found out I needed a new one. Every time the bike got hot, one of the cylinders would stop firing. In the lower curve anyway, I think it kicked in on the higher curve, but in the lower curve it stopped firing. So it sounded like I was riding a thumper. I chose the Dynatec and I was happy I did. It's been great. I've had no issues with it. Until I, I when I went with the, uh, the Screaming Eagle head, head, the higher compression head doesn't need as such a, an aggressive advance on the curve. I didn't know this when I sent the bike in to get the heads put on. So I had it on the most aggressive curve and I got it back. And I took it for the first ride and I was freaking mortified. What had I done? It was rough, especially in the lower RPMs. It wasn't too terribly bad, up around 3,000 RPM, but oh my god. I thought I made a huge mistake. So, you know, I quickly got online, found out, pulled the curve back. So I pulled the curve back one setting out of the presets. And hallelujah. Big, big difference. One thing about the, the module is you will notice that if you're out for a long ride, especially if you're in the city, you have to uh, stop and go. The module will heat up and it will suffer, at least I think it's the module's causing this, it will suffer some level of performance deterioration where the bike would just sound like it's sparking hard. Anyway, once the bike cools down, uh, it's back to being uh, s smooth sailing. So in all the years I've owned the bike, I've owned this bike since 2001. I believe I'm the second owner. And uh, 
The only major problems I've ever had with it, which were pretty much age related, was I had starter issues one year. Uh, the stock carburetor choked up in the repair kit, we like the Regasky kit we got for it. It uh, didn't work very well. It looked like a sieve, so I ended up just replacing the carburetor. And I had on the 89, it's uh, the stock one is a uh, key and butterfly carb, 40 mil. But for normal street riding, I wouldn't get too worked up about going with a super high performance carburetor. If you have a stock butterfly carb, you're probably good with a change of jets. If you have the pipes and the air cleaner or whatever done, you probably get sufficient performance out of that. A lot of guys upgrade to the, the stock 40 millimeter CV carb from the 90s and above. They're more uh, adjustable for performance than the butterfly. I find the only problem I really have with this bike nowadays, as far as uh, replacing things when they start to go from age, is uh, so many things are obsolete now. You have to go aftermarket, and that's a crapshoot. I've often said that Harley should bring back the FXR series bikes with a newer motor room. Every time I bring this up to the dealership, they just groan now. Not again, Bill. Tell you what, if you're going to run the higher compression heads, you got to let her loose once in a while. This carbon buildup becomes noticeable and quickly. If you're just puttering around at 1500 RPM or 1800 RPM all the time, you know, it's like getting rougher and rougher. Anybody watching this, if you're thinking of moving to an FXR from a newer model of Harley, particularly uh, one of the newer twin cams, uh, one thing to note is uh, the gearing is really short on these older FXRs. bikes I've ridden recently, I'd say the gearing is about the same as what you'd see on a Sportster 883. So how are your uh, horsepower and torque when I hopped up back to XR going to compare to one of the new twin cams. Well, you'll notice off the line, the twin cam is going to pull you further faster. But they die off pretty quick after the mid range. And you'll match them, no problem. Dunlop 
GT501s, which unfortunately Dunlop was discontinued, but they're a great tire for grip. This bus got pretty decent life out of it too, I think about, you expect like 11,000 miles on these tires. I mean, they're not a sport bike tire, but they're advertised as like a sport touring tire for hobbies. Or they were. If you're lucky enough to find a set, go ahead and get them. I uh, but uh, stock FXR, if you're still running the belt, you can go as wide as a 140 series tire and have it work without rubbing the belt. You'll have about maybe 3 16ths probably on the clearance between the sidewall and the, uh, the side of the tread and the belt. Uh, you will have to modify the lower belt guard if you do that. So you don't rub. There's a, kind of a rubber flap that hangs down on the inside of the belt guard. And it's got rivets that hold it in place on an aluminum strip. Uh, you pretty much have to cut that off. Like uh, drill out the rivets and lose the rubber flap or cut the rubber flap in such a way that it's going to miss the sidewall of the tire as it turns. Which is what I did. Uh, you can run the top belt guard no problem. But a 140 fits no problem. That's with everything in line too. I haven't offset anything to accommodate the tire. Uh, no problem with the 140. Gives you, gives you a bigger footprint, a slightly wider looking back tire. One of the modifications I made to the front suspension other than bringing it down a little bit in height, was uh, I took out the uh, air assist equipment. I took all that out. I took out the uh, the solenoid. I removed the, uh, the little valve that flows air between the handlebar and the forks. And I changed out the original springs. Now the air system on an FXR is in good shape. It works fine. It handles the wallops really nicely, the, the dips and whatsoever. Uh, I had to run it at 13 PSI to avoid it watering out on me over anything rougher than the smooth pavement. And at 13 PSI, like I said, does a good job in the to doos uh, I find it really made the front end vibrate over like uh, small cracks, lateral cracks, transition strips, uh, tar strips, things like that would make the front suspension vibrate rather than actuate. So it was almost like there was a lot of stiction going on with the air system. And uh, my uh, mine was prone to leaking despite having had it rebuilt. So I ended up getting fed up with it. Uh, without the air system, the uh, stock springs and the forks were too soft. And you'd uh, lose a lot of travel and you'd bottom out over even like moderate little bumps. So I yanked out the system and I put in progressive springs progressive suspension. They cost about 80 bucks. They come with spacers. I found uh, the spacers it provided weren't quite long enough for the stiffness I wanted. So I added in a couple of washers on top of each spacer. And then I kept the stock fork caps because they were uh, tapped for uh, the banjo bolts for transferring the air to the reservoir and the handlebars. And I just put uh, solid bolts in those holes, so just so I can change out the fork oil without having to remove the, the top cap space. But, uh, I find with the Progressive Springs that the suspension is much more supple, and it soaks up bigger bumps no problem, and it also uh, re eliminated any vibration I got through the forks from. Uh, from the smaller uh, lateral cracks and stuff. So that's a change I would highly recommend to anybody. Like I said, if your air system's working fine, stick with it. As soon as you get a problem, though, uh, for the cost of rebuilding the air system to get it to work, you can switch out to uh, Progressive Springs and get it. In my opinion, from all the kilometers I've put on this bike, uh, the Progressive Springs are a much better way to go. I don't have any kind of uh, valve control in here, uh, you know how people put in the, the RevTech or the Recore emulators. Uh, 
I haven't done that yet. I am planning on doing that because over repeat bumps it will pogo a bit. I think it's annoying as hell. Especially when I've got these uh, lovely shocks in the back end that do such a great job of controlling the bumps. I should get the uh, finalized the actuation of the forks to match. Great springs, just the damping sucks, so I thought about going with an inverted front end, but you know, you just get into a money pit if you do something like that. You got tons of cash burning a hole in your pocket. Sure, if you go that route, make the bike even look more sporty. But don't get me wrong, it is a very sporty bike, but it's not a sport bike. Inverted forks are nice, but then you get into the, well now you need brakes, then you need the brake line to those brakes. Uh, you need pads, and then you need uh, probably a different axle, and a different wheel, and then you want to back wheel to match. And next thing you know, your, your decision to go with the different front end is costing you 6,000 bucks or more. And considering you pick up a good used FXR for anywhere from six to $18,000, depending on who's selling and how much gold do you think their bike is made of. Let's see, stick with the stock forks. Throw in a good set of springs. Maybe a set of cartridge emulators. So. Are you good to go? The progressive suspension does not make 970 series shocks specific to the FXR models. So the ones I have on here were designed for the XR1200X Sportster. Which was that really sporty looking Sportster that had the plastic tail and the plastic covered gas tank. An aggressive suspension. By the way, uh, being as the XR1200X Sportster weighs almost the same as a uh, FXR, I figured the spring rates would be just dandy. So I picked up a set of 14 inch 970 series shocks. Had to mount them upside down because their reservoir would uh, wouldn't work in the position with the uh, fender struts because the shocks on the FXRs really tuck into the frame and uh, they have been absolutely wonderful. Uh, money well spent, you can fine tune that right really well and quickly, it's not complicated. So, uh, with the exchange rate on Canadian currency, to American currency, shocks that cost, would cost about 900 bucks in the States, cost me $1,300 up here. But I'm happy with them, I'm very happy with them. I did check with uh, Progressive that I could run them upside down without any issues. And they said, no worries, go right ahead. So I did. Because I, I get comments, uh, or had a couple comments anyway, regarding them being installed upside down, like, oh, they're not going to work properly because of uh, where the tighter wind on the spring is, is on the wrong end of the shock now, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's a bunch of baloney. You can run them upside down. It doesn't affect how the shock works. Not in the least.